Good morning, everybody. This is Ben Kieser with Applied Flow Technology. Hope that you all are doing very well and having a wonderful middle of your week. And thank you for attending our webinar on an introduction to AFT Impulse. I'm looking forward to uh, demonstrating some excellent capabilities to you all. And we're going to talk about uh, what is Water Hammer and how bad can it really be. And you're going to learn how AFT Impulse can help you quantify how bad it will be on a computer before something bad would happen in a real system, which is exactly what you want to avoid. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. This webinar is being recorded. And uh, a couple of things, as you all know, you can always uh, register for our upcoming webinars through our website, AFT.com. And then under webinars, you can go to upcoming webinars. And we've got all of them scheduled throughout the year. But we will be adding some additional webinars still. So make sure that you always check back here often so that you can stay on top of all the excellent content that we're providing to you all. In addition to that, we have a webinar library where you can find previously recorded webinars on our website. Uh, just go there and fill out the form. And once you're in, you'll be able to access any of our previously recorded webinars. And uh, this is important because I did a webinar on an introduction to AFT Fathom back in February. It's uh, this webinar uh, right here, actually. And um, this is a unique webinar with Impulse because I'm actually going to use the model that I built in Fathom. I'm going to bring it into Impulse and do my water hammer analysis on that system now. And so uh, if you haven't watched this webinar, be sure to give it a watch when you have a chance, and you'll see how the model came to be where it is today. So that's a couple of things about our webinars. I'm going to go ahead and jump back in and get started now, and uh, we'll move forward. So how bad is Water Hammer, and how bad can it uh, – well, um, you can see some really bad pictures here. Uh, cracks in pipes, cavitation on impellers, collapsed piping. And uh, I'm a huge fan of movies, and so to get things going – I'm going to go ahead and start us off with a couple of videos to watch. So uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy. So give me just one second here, and I'll pull up my first video for you all. Uh, if it'll play, that'll be good. Not sure why it's not playing. Let me try this again here. Hmm. I just got done testing this video, and I know that it works. And so I apologize for the technical difficulties. Let me find it somewhere else here. Hmm. Well, I don't understand why this video is not playing here. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, We'll try the other video, see if this will work. No, it's not.
Okay, well, I apologize, everybody. This is terrible that the videos are not working. Uh, I tested them before the webinar, and they worked perfectly fine, and now they're not. So uh, this just goes for my record, where I apparently have to experience a major technical difficulty in just about every single webinar and lunch and learn type of presentation that I do. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip the webinars, uh, or not the webinars, um, skip the videos, and uh, jump into things here. So uh, I apologize for that. Um, what is water hammer? Uh, it's a transient phenomenon in liquid piping systems that causes a uh, departure from a steady state operation. And so it's the process where your piping system is adjusting to new conditions. Uh, it can cause by several different events like a, a valve closure or a pump that's turning on. Uh, you can have a relief valve or check valves that are uh, popping open and closed in response to other transients that are going on in the system. And so there's a lot of different things that can cause water hammer. And AFT impulse models water hammer due to mechanical transients. So uh, any of those things where you have a device that is changing its operation, that will cause water hammer in your system. And you want to make sure that the pressure surges that it experiences uh, do not cause a problem. Uh, what can AFT Impulse help you with? It'll help you uh, identify where the maximum surge pressures will happen, and it'll give you uh, guidance on how to in, uh, implement various uh, surge suppression measures to help mitigate those uh, issues. Uh, it can also help you maintain code compliance. Uh, if you're in an emergency operation, uh, make sure that you have a safer and reliable system. Uh, it's certainly going to help you increase the lifespan of your piping system equipment. Uh, it can help you remove problems in your system that might be uh, having some chattering check valves, relief valves, or control valves, uh, things like that. Um, it'll definitely identify if you've got cavitation in, happening in your system, and, and that'll give you an indication of what the pressure spikes will be if you have a cavitation collapse. Uh, some general points about AFT Impulse is uh, it's an excellent pipe network uh, surge analyzer. Uh, a couple things I want to point out here. Impulse does have a steady state solver, and the reason why is because initial conditions need to be established first before the transient analysis can begin. And so Impulse is going to use the same steady state solver that Fathom does, where the newton raston method is going to solve the steady state mass and momentum balance. For the transients, we're going to use the method of characteristics, which will solve the transient mass and energy balance, or mass and momentum balances. A couple of important assumptions. Uh, flow is liquid. All pipes are liquid full, and flow is one-dimensional. And your wave speed is staying constant during the transient. And this is an important assumption in regards to cavitation, because if you have cavitation, in reality, your wave speed is going to change. And so Impulse is very good at modeling discrete levels of cavitation as long as it does not become a dominant characteristic of your system. And so uh, it's not a limitation of Impulse. It's a limitation of the mathematical models that are not able to handle a changing wave speed that would happen in reality because cavitation is a very heavy two-phase flow phenomenon. I'm not going to go into too much math here. All I wanted to do was show you all the various working equations for the uh, transient that Impulse is doing. We've got the transient mass balance and the transient momentum balance right here. And those are the equations that are being solved. And uh, the way that we're solving them is by using the method of characteristics. And uh, you can basically ignore all this jargon if you want. That is simply the uh, various uh, momentum and mass balances that are combined and rearranged. And the thing I want you to focus on here is the method of characteristics grid, this guy. And so in order to do the transient calculations, we have to do two things. One, we have to figure out the time step 
And so you've got a time step and uh, you're moving forward in time there. And then you've got a pipe length. And in order to do the method of characteristics uh, for the calculations, the all the pipes in your system have to be broken up into sections. So this is one section right, uh, one station right here. This is the next station, third station, etc. And from the inlet to the outlet of each station, you've got a section. So you've got a section there, a section there, a section there, etc. And so the reason why this is important is because at any point in time, your uh, mass flow rate and pressure along the whole piping system is not necessarily going to be the same along the whole length of the pipe. It's changing. And so that's something that needs to be captured properly for doing a water hammer analysis. Uh, the other thing is that with the uh, method of characteristics, why this is useful is because it allows the new pressure and new mass flow rate at each new time step to be calculated explicitly. It doesn't require iteration. And so uh, you simply go through and you calculate what your new pressure and flow rate is based upon the upstream conditions, the downstream conditions at your previous time step. And I want to point out that when you have a pipe with a given pipe length, uh, it can be really long. The more pipe sections that you have, the longer your runtime is going to be because you're going to have more calculations. And so when you're working with impulse, you want to simplify your model to try and eliminate as many of those uh, short sections of pipe as you can. And that way you can sacrifice long run times, but you'll still have really good results. And I'm going to uh, show you that before or show you that a little bit later. All right, moving right along here, various components that can be modeled, uh, pressure and flow boundaries that are changing over time. You can model pumps and account for their inertial effects. Uh, if you're doing a pump start or a pump stop, uh, you can easily model both centrifugal and positive displacement pumps, uh, pumps with flow controllers or VFDs. You can model pressure and flow control valves, uh, regular valves that are changing over time. Uh, you can model check valves. Uh, relief valves, uh, different pieces of surge suppression equipment like gas accumulators, surge tanks, vacuum breaker valves, etc. So this is the basic impulse modeling process and if you're familiar with AFT Fathom already or AFT Aero, then you're about 80% of the way there on knowing how to use AFT impulse. So you're still going to define your system properties for your fluid in the same way. Uh, you're going to build the model just like you would with Fathom or Impulse by laying out the pipes and junctions. The next step that you would do that's key to Impulse is you're going to define what types of transients you want to model, either a pump trip or a valve closure, uh, things like that. After you set up your transients, you're going to section your pipes. That's how you break your pipes up into bits to uh, figure out what your time step is going to be and also to figure out how many sections are going to end up in each pipe. Again, the more sections that you have, the longer that your runtime is going to be. After that, you'll define your transient control. That is simply uh, where you define how long you want to run your simulation for. Uh, you'll specify how often you want to save your transient output things like that. After you uh, run your model, you're going to analyze the results. You'll check things like what the maximum and minimum pressures are in your system. Uh, you'll view some transient junction graphs, like if you're doing a pump trip, you want to see how your pump is going to decay over time. Or maybe you want to see what the uh, pressure is doing at the suction and discharge of a pipe, or maybe a valve that's closing. Um, you'll also do some maximum and minimum pressure profiles where you plot a certain parameter over a pipe length. And then also the best way of analyzing the results and impulse is by doing animations. And so only looking at the maximum and minimum values, as you will see, it will not complete the entire picture for you. It's important to pay attention to what's happening over time over a whole flow path. So you're going to see how to do an animation today, and that's the best way of being able to analyze your results. 
All right, so this is the model that I built in the previous webinar. It's a simple water, uh, water delivery system where it's delivering uh, 500 gallons per minute of water up a hill. Uh, there's a 200 foot elevation change in the system. Uh, we've got a flow control valve right here. And uh, the piping system was sized so that the velocities stay below six feet per second. That is a key thing with water hammer is making your steady state velocities as low as you can because the higher your velocities are, the larger your pressure surges will be. So if you can make those pipe sizes a little bit larger, you're not going to have as high of surge pressures in your piping system. And uh, I was also able to figure out what the liquid height is. And I'm going to show you how you import a model from Fathom into Impulse. But before we do that, let me show you the model in Fathom itself. Here's the piping system. And I just want to run it really quick to identify a couple of key results. So if we go to the output window here, you can see that the uh, flow rate is 500 gallons per minute. Uh, you can see that all the velocities are under six feet per second. Uh, you can note what the uh, pressures are throughout the system. Uh, basically between uh, two and 110 PSIG are the operating pressures in this piping system here. Uh, you can see what the pump operation is at 500 gallons per minute. It's uh, got a DP of 104 PSI. Uh, it's generating 241 feet ahead operating very close to the best efficiency point, 95% uh, of the BEP, so that's good. And then also for our valve summary, we can see here that our uh, regular valve uh, downstream, uh, which is uh, right here, this guy, uh, he is a, a valve that's stuck open in a fully open position with a K factor of about 2.2. And then we've got our flow control valve, uh, which is partially open as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring this model into Impulse. In order to do that, it's really easy. So all you would do is run Impulse, and from there go to File and then Open. What you want to do next is you want to make sure that you specify your file type to be All. Because if you're looking for a Fathom model but you don't change it to find Fathom files or All files, you won't be able to find it. So make sure you change the file type first. Next is I browse to the location of where my model file is saved, and it's this guy right here, pump size and example for impulse. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up here. And just asking you a couple of questions here. Now, this message that it's popping up right now is trying to combine pipes. And so, as you can see here, when I brought the model in from Impulse, these were elbow junctions originally. And this was a screen junction right here. So, when you bring a model from Fathom or Arrow into Impulse, it's going to retain all of the K factor data and elevation information and whatnot. But some of the junctions are going to be changed to something like a general component with a K factor instead of a elbow with a K factor. The reason for that is because you want to simplify your model as much as you can. And that way you would still maintain accuracy, but you wouldn't end up with those long run times. So with all those elbows being in there uh, before, I would have some shorter segments of pipe. And so this message is trying to combine those pipes because an elbow has no transient data associated with it. So instead of having those being explicitly modeled, it's best to lump their appropriate losses into the, uh, the pipe itself. And that way you can still take into account for their K factors and their elevation changes, but you're going to have less of a runtime. Now, when I go here and import the model, I'm not going to combine the pipes yet. So I click OK, I'm just going to click on Cancel. So here's my system, and as you can see, all my elbows were brought in now as general components with the same K factor that we had before. And if you look at the uh, checklist here, we just need to do a very quick update of the system properties. 
The reason why is because in Fathom, we don't have the bulk modulus of elasticity. This parameter here is required for the transient calculations and impulse. So all I need to do is simply open up this window and then click OK. That way the bulk modulus is set up. And now that will check off the rest of the options here. So I could run my model in steady state. And I'm going to do that real quick here. So if I run my model in steady state, you're going to see the exact same results that you see in Fathom. The uh, volumetric flow rate, you're going to see the same velocities, uh, the same pressures. You'll see the same pump operation, uh, same uh, valve operation, etc. Now, I'm going to start marching forward with doing our transient calculations. The transient that I'm going to do for this system is... <coughs> I'm going to close uh, this valve over time. And I don't know what valve closure timing that I need to use with uh, yet. It's a six inch diameter piping system. So I'm gonna start with a one second valve closure. Maybe it can be closed that fast. Uh, so we're gonna start off with closing that valve in one second. And we're gonna monitor what the uh, transient response throughout the system will be. So in order to do that, uh, we can do a transient based upon a K factor, but with the K factor, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to think backwards. Uh, a closed valve would have a K factor of negative one. So if you use a CV value, it's a little bit easier. But here's the thing. My valve uses one of the handbook type of valves that we have in our database that we provide for you. And so I've got a K factor, but I don't know the CV. Well, if you run the model in steady state, you can go right here and see that your CV based upon this K factor is going to be 732 and a half. Let's call it 800. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to the workspace and I'm going to create a new child scenario called um, initial valve closure. I'm doing this because I want to preserve my base scenario. So if I mess anything up, I could always go to my base scenario and have a fresh start from there. So in my initial valve closure scenario, I'm going to open up the valve here, change it to a user specified in a CV loss model. And my fully open CV is going to be 800 in this case. And to do my transient, I'm going to close the valve over a period of one second. So it's going to start at a CV of 800, and it's going to go down to zero within a second. It's a pretty fast closure. Uh, it's linear. Uh, this will certainly cause problems in the system, and we're going to see what happens. Uh, it's a very simple time transient. That means that the uh, transient that you see uh, in the table here will happen over this profile. We're going to talk about what event transients are a little bit later in the webinar today. So for right now, I'm just doing a very simple time transient. So once I click OK and I turn on my transient modeling, you can see that you have a little t by the junction ID number. That indicates that you have a transient set up for that component. And so... Uh, now I can do a transient and uh, it'll do my method of characteristics calculations. Once I turn on the transient operation, you can see that the two additional items below the checklist became active. So now I need to section my pipes in order to determine my time step. And it, it sections your pipes based upon the shortest pipe in your system. And so here, if you look in the model data window, if you use consistent units, which I recommend, it's easy to see that your shortest pipe is 20 feet long and your longest pipe is 1,000 feet long. So when you break all these pipes up into bits, it's going to break all of your pipes up into equivalent lengths of uh, 20 feet if I use one section in the controlling pipe. If I do two sections in the controlling pipe, then that would be... 10 feet segments in every pipe. Again, the more sections that you have, the longer your runtime will be. 
So you want to make sure that you avoid those really short lengths of pipe. Uh, it's best to make them a little bit longer if you can. Okay, so in order to section my pipes, you can just click on this link right here in the uh, checklist. And I'm going to go with two sections in the controlling pipe. Again, that means I've got 10-foot segments there in every pipe throughout the system. And that's just because it's got low uh, error in the modification of wave speed. That's a whole other discussion for itself. I'm not going to go into it right now. But you can see that our time step right here is 2 milliseconds. So that's a really good time step that's going to give very fine resolution for being able to analyze uh, the water hammer in the system here. So my pipes are now sectioned. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to specify my transient control. And so I'm closing the valve in one second. I want to see what happens in the first 10 seconds of the simulation. So I'm going to run it for 10 seconds. I'm going to use our gas cavity model for cavitation. It's a bit more accurate and uh, does a bit better of a job on things. Actually, no, I'm going to start off with the, the default first so you can see uh, what this does to the cavitation that you'll see in the system. Here I'm going to save all piping stations for my results, and I'm going to save my results for my junction data. There we go. That way I can view all my output in a very nice format. So now I've got all green check marks, and I am now ready to run my model for the transient analysis. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Oops, forgot to do one more thing here. Turn that off. There we go. All right. Now it's ready to run. Okay. So what it's doing right now is it's using the method of characteristics to solve the mass and momentum transient balances over time. And it broke up all the pipes into that grid and broke them up into sections. That way it can figure out what the or how the uh, flow rates, velocities, and pressures are changing all throughout the system. Okay, so let's take a look at some results here. Uh, as we can see, we've got some warnings. we got a lot of information. Let's break it down one by one. The first thing that we want to figure out, what is the maximum system pressure in the system here? Well, if you look at the transient max min table, you can see that based upon this list here, the maximum pressure is 717 PSIA, and that happens to be right at the valve. Uh, it's at the valve inlet, actually. So that is the maximum pressure in our system. That's a really high value. That's a really high surge pressure. So in order to get a feel for what's going on, let's compare the maximum pressures with the pressures from steady state. So here, everything's above at least 400 PSI. If you go to look at the steady state values, you can see that the steady state pressures are much less. Now, it's a lot more difficult to review your results with the uh, tables here, so that's why it's a lot more useful to do, uh, to do some graphing. So for my graph results window, what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a profile plot and I'm going to cross plot together my pressure, my maximum pressure with my steady state pressure over the flow path. So once I generate that, I'm going to turn on my label locations. And uh, this is the valve right here. So as you can see, the maximum pressure that happens in the system is right at the valve inlet. And you can see here that the whole system pressure is much, much higher than my steady state pressure there. Now, really quick, I don't like those colors. I'm going to change one of the colors here really quick. And I'm going to make this uh, blue for my steady state. Now that I've generated my graph, I'm going to look at this graph a few times during my analysis. So I'm going to file this graph away so I can access it later without having to always reset the parameters every time. So I'm going to call this uh, max and steady state pressure profile. There we go. So as you can see here, those maximum pressures are, are very high. 
Now let's go back to the Alpha window and open up the Transient Maximin uh, table again. This time, what I want to focus on is what are the minimum pressures? Well, if you look at the minimum pressure column right here, the minimum pressures at every single pipe is 0.3616. Well, that's kind of odd. What's going on there? Well, if we open up the system properties window, we can see here that the vapor pressure is 0.3616. So what that means is you have cavitation that's going on in your system. That's one indicator to identify if you have cavitation is by looking at what your minimum pressure is in the max min table and seeing if this value is equal to your vapor pressure. If it is or if it's lower, you've got cavitation. Here's the other indicator. You've got a warning message right here that says the following pipes have vapor volumes in computing stations greater than 10%, but less than 100% of the computing volume. And then it tells you where. So it tells you right here at the valve outlet, your cavitation is becoming significant. This means that your vapor volume at that station is getting to be 40% of the volume of that piping section, okay? And so a rule of thumb is your cavitation calculations will be more accurate as long as your cavitation is about 10% or lower than what your uh, computation station volume is. Now, this still may be realistic, the final indicator of cavitation is if you look at the maximum vapor volume column, you can see that you've got vapor volumes all throughout your piping system. So you're cavitating all throughout your entire piping network. And that's a real problem because when you have cavitation, you're going to see chaotic behavior. So are these maximum pressures really realistic? Well, that's where you have to take a much deeper dive into your water hammer analysis. Don't just look at your maximum and minimum pressures only. It's really important to pay attention to what's going on throughout the entire system as a whole. So let's, div well, let's dive into this here a, a bit further now. Uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to examine some uh, uh, pressures throughout the system here. So... If you go to the workspace, you can actually generate a graph right from the workspace. So I want to look at what the pressure is at the inlet and outlet of the valve. So I'm going to right click on the valve right there. And I'm going to generate a graph for the pressure. And then I'm also going to add on vapor pressure to that as well. Or vapor volume rather. And then I'm going to move my scales up here, or my legends up. Okay, so here's what's going on. Uh, we've got two different colors. The blue color is the valve inlet. That's indicated by pipe stick station number 10. That is uh, right here at the outlet of that pipe. So the blue line represents the valve inlet. The red line represents the valve outlet. So I'm going to file this way as a graph uh, list item. I'm going to call it uh, pressure and vapor volume at valve. Now let's break this down a little bit and see what's going on here. So I'm going to turn off the uh, values downstream of the valve, and we're going to focus on the upstream valve first. So if you take a look at what your maximum pressure is in your system, you can see that it occurs right here, 717 PSIA. <laughs> As I move my mouse, it's, uh, well, here's an easy way to find it. If you show the graph data just like this on the side, you can right click and find the maximum just like that, and then from, uh, once you find the maximum, you can then convert it to an annotation. So here I've got my annotation now for my graph.
That's where my maximum pressure is. But the thing that I want to point out is you've got tons and tons of cavitation going on way before, several seconds before your maximum value occurs. So is this pr maximum pressure that you see realistic? It's hard to say. But the moral of the story is if you're only looking at the maximum value in that transient max min table, it's not getting you a full picture of what's going on. If you're only looking at that value, you miss all of the information that's going on right here. And so you've got lots of cavitation. If you look at the vapor pressure or the vapor volume, you can see how your vapor volumes grow and collapse over time. So when you grow in vapor volume right here, you can see that you'll have pressure at vapor pressure. Then once it collapses, your vapor volume goes to zero, and then you are going to have a resulting pressure spike. The rule of thumb is when you're evaluating cavitation, it's usually the first few pressure spikes that you see that will be the most realistic. So uh, this may or may not be real here. Um, I'm not going to go into more detail on how to evaluate cavitation. Uh, that's a whole other hour-long webinar by itself. Um, but it's something that you definitely want to make sure you pay attention to. If I turn on the red graph here, this is the cavitation that's happening downstream of the valve. So you've got cavitation happening on both sides of the valve right there, and it is significant. <clears throat> what I can do next is I can also plot the transient pressures at the pump. So let's see what's going on there. If I plot the transient pressures, you can see that you've got some massive cavitation at the pump as well. And so you've got vapor pressures happening all throughout the system. Uh, you definitely don't want cavitation to happen because that's going to destroy your impeller and, and your system. And it's going to give you a, a, like the first picture that you saw in the webinar today. So you don't want cavitation going on there. So I'm going to file this away as well. Call it pump suction and discharge pressure. All right. Let's look at one more thing. Let's see what the flows are doing because I have another warning message that I've not talked about yet. So this warning message here says that pump three has backwards flow and it does not have reliable data to support the calculations. So what's going on here? Well, let's take a look at the flow rates at the pump. So if I go back to my workspace here, I can right click on the pump and I can look at the volumetric flow rate through the pump. I'm going to call this pump flow rate. As you can see here in your system, you have flow rates through the pump which are less than zero. So you've got backwards flow. Well, what happens when you have backwards flow in a pump? Uh, well, we don't know what to do with that. So if you have a normal pump curve that looks like this, if you have reverse flow or negative flow rate, what pump head do you use for those calculations? We don't know. So what we're using right here is we are using the shutoff pump head for any flows that are less than zero. So that is not accurate. You're going to need to have a better way to evaluate what your actual true pump head is when you have reverse flow. So there's something built into impulse that can help you quantify that. And that's what we uh, that's what's called a four quadrant data set. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create another child scenario. I'm going to call it uh, with four quad data. So here's the change that I'm going to make is on my pump, I'm going to go in here. My rated speed is 2738 RPM. And I'm going to go to the transient tab. I'm not going to do a pump trip or a pump start yet. All I'm going to do is I'm going to do a no transient, but I'm going to in, uh, include four quadrant pump data. That way I can have a more accurate prediction of what the pump is, uh, the pump head is, 
when I have reverse flow. So this is my four quadrant data right here. And so that's going to help me get a more accurate characterization under reverse flow or reverse speed circumstances. So now I can rerun my model and see what's going on when I make that change to the pump. So it's running and it's almost done here. All right, let's take a look at the output. As you can see, when I did a four quadrant data set, it did help lower my maximum pressures a little bit. So that's good. And I don't have that warning message about not having accurate pump predictions for reverse flow. So let's see what's going on here with our graphs. If I go to my graph results window, this is why you want to use the graph list manager, because instead of having to go through and reset these parameters every time, just double click on your graph list manager and that will reset your graphs on the spot. And uh, so erase my drawings here. So here's my maximum pressure profile uh, compared to my steady state pressure. So you can see it's not as high as 717 anymore. So that's good. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add on an animation to see uh, to show you how the pressure is changing throughout your system over time. And so I'm going to update that. And I'm going to play the animation. So as I mentioned, just looking at the maximum and minimum values, it does not complete the whole story. If you look at your uh, pressures, uh, there's your pressures at the uh, pump. Here's your pressure and vapor volume at the valve. So it's still showing that you've got a lot of cavitation going on. And here's your flow rate through the pump. So with the four quadrant data set, Impulse is using a more accurate uh, way to be able to calculate your pump head in that situation. So with an animation, you can see how the pressures change over this whole flow path over time. So if I play that, my uh, valve closes. And as you can see, when the valve closes, you've got your pressure spike. So if you watch this lighter blue line here, your pressure goes up downstream of the valve. Your pressure goes down. This is where it starts hitting vapor pressure, and you start having cavitation all throughout your entire system. And so when I go back to default speed, you can see how that cavitation adds a massive amount of chaos to your network and uh, how realistic is this behavior? It's difficult to say. That's where you'd have to look in further depth with evaluating your water hammer at a closer level. So basically, the moral of the story is if we're doing a valve closure in one second, then that's going to still uh, bring about large pressure surges throughout the system. So now let's try a five second closure. So I'm going to create another scenario here and I'm going to call it five second closure. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the valve here and instead of closing it in one second, I'm going to close it in five seconds. And so now I can rerun my analysis. All right. Well, the good news is when we specified a, uh, a slower closure over five seconds instead of one second, we have a lot lower pressures in our system for our maximum values. We've eliminated a lot of cavitation in this system. We still have a little bit, which is going to cause an impact, but there's not as much as there was before. Let's take a look and see what's happening with our graphs. So I go back to my graph results window. Here's my maximum uh, steady state pressure profile. And as you can see, the pressures are not as high. And I'm going to do my animation so you can see how the pressure is changing over time. 
So instead of closing in one second, it's closing in five seconds. Now, if you're paying attention to the time here, you can see that a few seconds have gone by. Uh, the valve is closing, and uh, as it closes, it still does not cause any difference in the results until it gets almost all the way closed. So as I keep moving along here in time, the valve starts closing. Now we start to see a response. It's just a lot slower of a response. And the valve is just about fully closed here. And then once the valve is fully closed, we've still got cavitation going on. So everywhere downstream of that valve, it's still dropped to vapor pressure and it's still causing a significant amount of chaos. So it did reduce the surge pressures that we saw um, in a decent fashion, but it's still not solving the problem. So what can we do next? Well, instead of closing this valve linearly like that, there's a different way that you can close the valve which can also significantly reduce your maximum surge pressures that you'll see in your system. So I'm gonna call this the 80-20 valve closure. I mean, it's not gonna let me do a slash, so I have to do something different. There we go. Okay, so here, I've not even started to use surge suppression equipment yet, like a relief valve or a gas accumulator or a surge tank. You may not need one. So what I'm gonna do is instead of closing the valve linearly over five seconds, I'm gonna close the valve 20% of the way in the first, or I'm gonna close the 80% of the way in the first 20% of the time it takes to close the valve. Then in five seconds, it'll be completely closed. So here's how my new valve closure profile looks like. I close it almost all the way really fast, and then the rest of the way over a much, much longer period of time. This is a very good rule of thumb to go by when you're doing a valve closure scenario because this in and of itself will significantly reduce surge pressures that you'll see in your system. So that's my new valve closure. Let's take a look and see how well it does. So I'm going to rerun my model again, and it's going to calculate based upon that new type of valve closure. Wow, look at that. I don't have any red scary warnings anymore, so that's good. Uh, if you look at this, your maximum pressures are uh, getting even lower, which is great. I don't have any pressures dropping down to vapor pressure. I don't have any vapor volumes. So look what I just did. I completely eliminated the cavitation that's going on with the system. Let's take a look and see what's going on with that animation there. So I take a look at the animation. Wow, that's much better. My red line representing the maximum pressure profile in the system is a lot closer to the solid blue lining meaning that I don't have as severe pressures throughout my network. So this is good. So if I go ahead and um, speed up the time for the animation here and run this, you can see how the valve closure uh, starts to close very quickly, but then it does a lot slower for the rest of the time. So now it's closing a lot more slowly And I'm going to set my default speed back to the default speed. And as you can see here, my pressures downstream of the valve and upstream of the valve, for that matter, stay very well above vape. Well, not very well above. Uh, they're about three or four psi above vapor pressure. So uh, what you can see here, though, uh, the issue is you still have a very large swing in pressure. So you can see that the pressure is oscillating from this point down to this point over time. And even though the graph is changing very slowly here, I've slowed down time. So if you watch that, it's going from you know 0.1 seconds over a very short period of time. So you still got a very large pressure swing from three PSI 
to about 175 PSI very, very quickly. And this is going to oscillate for a long time. Uh, we can run this model for 60 seconds, <clears throat> maybe a couple of minutes, and it could take quite a while for this pressure wave to dampen out over time, as well as the pressure wave upstream of the valve also. So we have eliminated the cavitation, which is good, but we still want to do something about this to make these uh, pressure surges not as severe. So here's where I'm going to actually include some surge suppression equipment with a gas accumulator. So let me add that in there uh, with gas accumulator. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop a gas accumulator right after the valve here. And I'm going to make a quick assumption. Let's assume that there's air inside of the accumulator. And let's assume that maybe it's pre-charged with uh, about five cubic feet of air, let's say. And what we want to do is we want to see how this uh, modifies the changes in pressure throughout our system. So uh, there's our gas accumulator. And I want to make sure I'm saving all my data. Let's run it for 60 seconds this time. So I'm going to run my model for 60 seconds instead of just 10. So here it takes a little bit longer of a time to converge. All right, while this is running here, I do see that there are a couple of questions that came in. Uh, one of them, a <laughs> very good question. Uh, how do I find four quadrant curves? Suppliers usually don't supply this. Is there any shortcut? Well, <laughs> that is where you're, uh, you know, in a bit of a conundrum because you're right. Uh, a lot of pump manufacturers do not publish four quadrant curves because they don't like to test their pumps under those bad conditions. So it is very difficult to get a pump manufacturer to give you a four quadrant data set. If you want one, you're probably gonna have to pay for it. Uh, in Impulse, we have 21 different four quadrant data sets based upon different specific speed values. And they come from a variety of references. And so uh, that, uh, the thing is, is if you don't have any other data to go on, then using one of our four quadrant data sets is the best way to go to get something more reasonable. Uh, a couple other questions uh, with uh, impulse, the control valve. Um, uh, you could control the, the pump. Um, let's see. Uh, the pump just run off its curve. That's a good question. Uh, um, about the uh, pump operating at deadhead. And I'm going to address that in just a minute here. And so uh, now that the model is done running here, let's take a look at the results. So here you can see what the, uh, what the maximum values are. Again, as you start to use the graphs, the max min table doesn't do very much for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new folder and uh, new graphs and what i'm going to do is i'm going to move this uh down into my new graph folder as well as my uh vapor pressure at the valve and then i'm going to create one more uh graph for the gas accumulator for the gas accumulator volume as well as the pressure I'm going to call it accumulator uh, P and V for pressure and volume. Okay. So uh, here's the other reason why all these graphing capabilities are so awesome is because you can do this where you can right click on the graph folder and load the folder items in the same tab. This is where the graphing capabilities of Impulse 6 have revolutionized the way that you do graphing. Looks like I need to fix one of these here. Uh, all. I'm going to turn off the maximum value there.
I need to, uh, let's see. Pressure profile animation. Going to delete that graph list item. Going to move this. There we go. All right. Try this one more time. Just had to do a little bit of graph rearranging there. Okay. That's what I want. <laughs> so this is really cool. What I've got here is, uh, where did my pen go? Let's see. So I've got my animation right here on the left. I have my pressure at the uh, valve, right, or actually at the pump right here. I meant to plot the valve pressure, not the pump pressure, but that's okay. And then here's my flow rate through the pump. Those are not the results that I wanted to show. Let me try this again. Okay. I think this is going to plot what I want it to plot now. Perfect. Okay. So I've got my animation on the left. I've got my gas accumulator volume my gas accumulator pressure, and my valve inlet and outlet pressure right here, all going on at the same time. So now when I play the animation, it's going to show you everything that's going on at the same time. So as you can see, my valve is closing over that uh, better profile. And you can see the vertical red line changing as well. So this makes it really useful to be able to figure out what's going on in different spots in your system at the same time as your animation. This makes it a lot easier to analyze the results for AFT impulse. And so as you can see here, uh, your gas volume inside your accumulator is, you know, fluctuating between about five and seven cubic feet. So that's not too bad. It doesn't seem like you might need that large of a gas accumulator. And then now that our valve is fully closed, you can see how the gas accumulator is doing a much better job at absorbing those pressure waves. So as you can see, it really does a fantastic job at dampening out the pressure surges throughout your system when you have that gas accumulator in place. Okay. <laughs> um, now, the, the question that I had was, uh, what about the pump? Well, uh, your pump is pumping against a closed valve. And so that would be the next scenario that I would do. I'm not going to run it, but I would create it and call it, uh, you know, with pump trip. So what you could do there is as this valve is closing, you can have this pump set to trip based upon a certain event. So now I'm going to do a trip with inertia, and I'm going to get my four-quadrant data set again here. Now this time, the trip event, instead of being based upon time, I'm going to have it be based upon valve CV. So I can set this to be once my valve that's closing gets to be less than or equal to a CV of 50, that's when my pump is going to trip. So when I do this here, I'm not going to actually run this, but that will actually allow you to have a pump decay over time. And so if you look at your uh, pump uh, speed versus time, you're going to see your pump operating at 100% speed for a little bit, that once your valve gets almost all the way closed, then the pump will trip. And so that's the next simulation that you would run there. Uh, and so... Uh, very good questions there. Um, anyway, 
that is the analysis that I had planned for you all today. And again, I apologize that I was having those technical difficulties and the videos weren't playing uh, for whatever reason. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We've got lots of uh, additional AFT products that will be very helpful for you. Uh, AFT Fathom for steady state liquids, AFT Aero for steady state gases, AFT Impulse, uh, of course. Uh, lots of resources to help you learn additional pieces about our uh, software. And uh, to contact us, you can contact me directly at benkeiser at aft.com. Again, that's benkeiser at aft.com. Or you can email our support team or our sales team, support at aft.com or sales at aft.com. And uh, I want to thank you all very much for your time today and hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about Impulse. Uh, make sure that you register for the next Impulse webinar that we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks where I'll be talking a lot more about surge suppression. So hope to see you all in the next one here. Uh, thank you very much for your time, everybody. Take care and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day.